All right. Good morning, you guys, or good day, good evening, wherever you are in the world. In fact, would you give me a shout out? I'd love to see where you guys are tuning in from. We've got a really awesome show. I want to just remind you of the things that will help you keep your head straight during all this chaos, confusion. These are really important things. As long as you can do them, def definitely do them. If you can get out for walks, I know some places you can't, you're completely locked down. Try to find something, if you can't walk, try to find something that will keep your attention off of these screens that we're looking at all the time and the bad news, just to get your attention focused outward. I take walks every single day with my dog and I just try to get my attention out into the world. That's really important. And as photographers, you know, we're looking. We need to look outward. That's what we do. Okay, second thing is journal. I really recommend journaling. I've done it for years. I've got, I don't know, dozens and dozens of journals. I may never go back and read any of that stuff. Certainly nobody else is going to read it, I hope. But you can put your your thoughts, your aspirations, your realizations, the things you want to overcome, whatever it is, put them in your journal. It really helps putting stuff on paper. And then the third thing, do something inspirational. Um, that's why you're coming to this show and that's an easy thing for us to fix because we're going to inspire you. Also, I made this new little film Oh, wow, we've got all kinds of people showing up. That's awesome. I'm going to give a shout out here in a second. But I made this new little film, which is from a poem by John Muir. If you don't know who he is, he's the guy that established the national park system in the United States and actually around the world. He, we owe him a huge debt for preserving the wilderness. So anyway, this poem I set to uh, music and visuals. Jared can put it on the screen, check it out. So before we bring our guest on, let me just say we've got um, Sandy in India. Okay, awesome. We've got David in Scotland. We've got uh, Parub in India also. And we've got T. Swang, if I'm messing up your name, I apologize. Good morning from Nepal. We have uh, Sao Paulo, Marcelo. Reese, uh, Mimi is in New York City. You're not far away from where Ed is. We have Jared from the Chicagoland suburbs. We've seen you a lot uh, on here, Jared. We've got Simone in London. Sean Kim in San Diego. We've got Pierre from Ottawa. Okay, good day. Uh, we have... <laughs> Bucharest, Anka, yes, uh, hi Anka, and um, Doniale in uh, Los Angeles, okay. Uh, okay, we've got too many to keep reading, but I'm really glad you guys are with me and with us. Keep tuning in, this is awesome. And if you haven't subscribed yet, please subscribe to the channel because that way you won't miss anything and enable that uh, bell. Okay, well now look. I'm going to introduce you to our guest. I'm going to show you some of his photos while I'm doing this. So Ed Kashi is an acclaimed photojournalist, which is an understatement. He is so thoroughly acclaimed that he's won all sorts of awards and he has numerous exhibitions. And it would be impossible for me to read everything he's done because he's done so much. But he uses photography to explore social issues that define our times. He's also a dedicated educator and mentor to photographers around the world, which is why he's back with us on AYP Live. And his visual storytelling has led to projects including the National Geographic. He's going to talk about these photos, by the way, guys. Um, National Geographic, The New Yorker, MSNBC, Fortune, New York Times Magazine, and a host of many others. And I am thrilled to have Ed back on Advancing Your Photography Live. Ed, welcome to the show. It's great to have you. Hello. Good to see you, Mark. Thank you for having me. Always a pleasure. So 
Why don't we just dive in? I'm I'm curious to know, like, what is your passion behind photography? What is it that gets you out of bed and drives you to pick up a camera and tell those stories? Um, so I can stay alive. Um, I think that uh, at this point, and you know, my wife would probably lament that this is who she's married, but uh, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm. This is what I. It's not just that it's what I know how to do. It's that it. Um, it's an interesting thing doing maybe doing anything for as long as I have but there's sort of an addictive quality to doing this kind of photography well any kind of photography really but for me you know I'm driven by a desire to, to engage with the world and uh, that puts me and all of us in a very interesting moment given the pandemic yes. because we're we're not supposed to engage with the world but um you know that is what as at the in the es that's the essence of doing this kind of work this sort of photojournalistic or documentary work what have you and so it also connects to my passions for you know politics geopolitics social issues um my desire to learn about the world i have an incurable incurable curiosity about things so you know, for me, those are the elements that sort of when I wake up, I, I'm like driven to try to figure out what stories can I tell? What issues can I engage with? And um, that's really been the case for about three or four decades now. You're getting the hang of it by now, I bet. And yeah, I mean, you know, I'd like to say that that I that you uh, you gain control of it. But I think if anything, it has more control over me than ever. Interesting. In what way? I mean, how how is that how does that affect you? Well, you, you remember what? Uh, yeah. No, well, you remember what, like Descartes said, "I think, therefore I am." Yep. So for me, it's I photograph, therefore I am. Uh -huh. That that for me, it really is about. Um, it, in some ways, I never feel more alive, except when I'm with my kids. I never feel more alive, and I'm not just saying that either about my kids, but you yeah. know. <laughs> I never feel more alive than when I'm when I'm in the world and I, and I could even be in my own home. It's not just about being out in foreign tough places. And yeah. I have some form of recording device in my hands, whether it's a video camera, a still camera, audio equipment, whatever it is that it's in some ways it's sort of, you know, I always think it's like akin to being an animal. Not that I know what this is like an animal on the hunt yeah. where, you know, all of the senses are alive. You know, everything is more acute. And so what's difficult is when you're not doing that, how do you still feel okay? Okay about yourself, okay about the world, and so forth. And I've written about that, but that's a big challenge, especially when you've done it for quite a long time. But um, yeah, you know, so there's a there's just this this feeling of, of, of energy and, and being alive and, and, and being tuned into the world when I'm when I'm working. I love that. And it's, a, you know, it's a recurrent theme on AYP. We're talking about storytelling and you're you're talking about it in terms of with either with a still camera, video camera, audio, you're you're still capturing a story in whatever way you're doing it, which is awesome. Yeah. So I have your photographs. If you want me to bring them up while you're talking about these points at any point, just let me know. We'll we'll switch you over. But what are some of the key points? And I asked you this in our interview, I think it was 10 years ago. But yeah. um, what are some of the key points that you use every time you pick up a camera or maybe even before you pick up a camera in terms of visualizing or pre planning or whatever? What are some of those key elements, Ed? So the, to answer that question, I have to there's a, it, context is important. Yeah. If I'm you know, if I'm just, which is pretty rare where I'd be like, you know, I just want to go out and make pictures, then I'm, I'll be reacting to, you know, the elements of the basic elements of photography, light composition, moments, mood, um, you know, those sorts of things. But most of the time when I'm going out with, to, to record, I'm, I'm doing it as a storyteller. So therefore it's very deliberate. And generally I've done a certain amount of homework or research so that, you know, basically, I want to I want to know as much as I can about the situations that I'm going into. Right. But still keep an open mind, because ultimately, no matter how much you've read or you've heard it, 
it's what's in front of you in the moment that ultimately is what you need to deal with and respond to. So, so therefore, yeah, you know, when I'm working in, in that storytelling mode, it's really about, you know, where do I need to be to get the visual elements I need to tell the story I'm trying to tell? Okay. Awesome. Well, I think, you know, probably the best way to do this is I'm going to bring up the images that you sent me. Let me get the right order here. Um, so we can see you. So you, whatever gestures you, you want to give, as long as they're appropriate for you to. Um, <laughs> We're starting with the girl in Vietnam, and I know we talked about these before. You have a lot of advocacy uh, journalism that you do, and I know this was part of that. But could you tell us about this girl in Vietnam? Yeah, that and photograph. so with absolutely, and with advocacy work, you know, it's something I'm doing more and more of. Uh, certainly, in the last like five or ten years, um, it's really about. It's, it's working in exactly the same mode as you would for a magazine or a newspaper uh, uh, or a personal project for that matter, but that there's a there's a there's an edge to it. There's a there's a real point that you're you're trying to shine a light on an issue to facilitate change or at least right. be part of change. You know, I, I would I'm you know, I, I'm, I'm too humble to think that anything I do is directly related to creating change. But I do know from experience that not only myself, but some of my colleagues have been a part of tremendous change through the stories that we tell and the photographs we've made. So with this picture, this was taken in Da Nang in Vietnam, and it was part of a pro the Vietnam reporting project, which actually emanated out of San Francisco in 2010. Uh -huh. And it was a, an NGO that was formed uh, which brought together, I think there's about 15 or 20 journalists and storytellers, broadcast journalists, radio journalists, photographers, filmmakers, writers. Um, and the idea was for each of us to come up with a, with a theme, with a story around Agent Orange, the issue uh -huh. of Agent Orange. And so I decided to look at uh, the impact of, the enduring impact of, of Agent Orange, which is that even today, babies in Vietnam and even, you know, probably grandkids or great grandkids of, of American veterans of the war in Vietnam are being born with certain disabilities or health issues right. because a, the ingredient in Agent Orange is dioxin and it's passed on genetically. So anyway, um, yeah. so, uh, so I decided to go to Da Nang. I worked with, um, um, with an American organization, uh, children of Vietnam based in North Carolina and uh, they hooked me up with a couple of families and this young girl was in one of in one of the families and she had been born with these you know deformities or whatever you want to you know these disabilities but she was this shining she is this shining light beautiful intelligent tremendous energy and that particular moment was uh i had been outside and i walked into her house and what you see is exactly what i saw that's an and amazing was, image yeah, as I say, the photo gods were like, oh, yeah, here's one. <laughs> Basically, don't screw it up, right? Really? <laughs> Let's just talk so, about it. Let's talk about it from a, just a color and composition standpoint. I mean, the the frames within frames and the the green contrasting color with her orange and the light that's on her face. I mean, that is stunning. Yeah, the, the pearls. The, the pearls. The, well, oh, whatever, yeah. the, the necklace and, the, and her gesture. You know, these are the things that we, you know, I, I dream of, you know, most of the time we're slogging through situations that are crap. Yeah. The light is bad. People are not cooperating. In some cases, you know, you have security issues to try to get the pictures you want. And then this was a case of, you know, just voila, here you go. Amazing. And again, thankfully, it all came together. And um, and, you know, I'm 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 honored to have been a part of this um this this effort because ultimately it uh was used to get the uh, u.s congress to um allocate millions of dollars to the government of vietnam to clean up uh, a remaining hot spot of agent orange in vietnam you know ed this is an example i've said this on the show and it's not it's some cliche, but we can change the world with photography and photography has changed the world. And this is an example. 
of br bringing something to the attention of Congress that could have otherwise and obviously was missed. But here you are bringing that to the, you're telling a story that they can't miss. Yeah. So. Now, but here and here's I want to just say, Mark, here's a key element to doing advocacy work, um, which is that to have great partners. So, yeah, I might have, you know, I was fortunate enough to create a story and in this case, a photograph that was powerful. But it was it was the organization that I was working with who who was able to lobby Congress in Washington, D.C., who had the connections. And this was through Ford Foundation money. So this is really important. Now, there are a handful of photographers who have done it all, yeah. you know, that have that have not only created great photography and great stories, but they're fierce in the way they've created their own NGOs or their own foundations. And, you know, Donna Ferrato is a great example of that. Um, uh, Stephanie Sinclair with Too Young to Wed. There's, there's a number of photographers who have, uh, who have not only done the, the, the storytelling, but have also created the infrastructure to have those stories facilitate change. Right. In my case, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a storyteller. I have the heart of an activist, but I am not an activist in the sense of, you know, knowing where to go to, to, you know, who, who to talk to and all that. So yeah. it's just a point, really important point in doing advocacy work is choose your collaborators wisely. It's a partnership. Because, exactly. That, that's a good point. Choose them wisely. Yeah. You know, yeah, Ansel Adams comes to mind as an environmentalist working with the Sierra Club. Uh, so even though he was providing the images, there were, you know, the they're doing the lobbying and all that. There's a whole lot of work that goes on besides just showing, you know, a slice of life. Obviously, it has to be brought to attention, the attention of those who can make those changes. And yeah. that, that makes sense to find your partners. And that's true as a as an artist in general. I mean, wh whoever you're collaborating with, it has to be somebody that you can really trust and, and mutually. So yeah. let's look at the next one. So this is, um, I believe, in Vietnam, the guy standing between the trees again. Here's I've, I've just got to talk about it from a compositional and lighting standpoint. It's just stunning. I mean, you have the the smoke, you know, with the light streaming through it. You've got this guy framed between the two trees to two kind of almost like spotlights on his feet. I mean, Ed, this is like the gods were with you again. It's, <laughs> it seems like a lot. But tell us about yeah. this. So so actually, that's in Nicaragua. OK. And, um, yeah, it's OK. And then this this is part of an ongoing project, a personal project. I'm in my seventh year now. I was just back in Nicaragua in February uh, for the Guardian newspaper to continue this work but um this is a a, a project this is a project looking at uh, chronic kidney disease of unknown origins uh -huh. and i've now worked in five countries over the last seven years nicaragua el salvador india sri lanka and peru and uh this is a passion project i also thankfully i have uh, great partners you know who are who are epidemiologists, researchers, activists, you know, trying to trying to find the causes of this disease because it it's very particular. It's not related to the usual causes of kidney disease, which is, you know, obesity, diabetes and high blood pressure. Right. This is something different. And clearly it looks like it's related to, you know, heat stress, working in very hot environments and with climate change and global warming, it's only made it worse for but most of the, in most cases, rural, poor rural agricultural workers. And that's what we found so far. So the, the, the purpose of this project is to literally work towards finding the cause and therefore the solutions. And I was very excited to go back uh, in February, which now feels like 10 years ago, uh, pre-pandemic, um, really? uh, to, to do this piece for The Guardian because it was actually a good news story. It was about how the organizations that I've been engaged with have come up with a simple solution, which is rest, water, and shade wow. for the workers. And okay. by doing that, by implementing that in Nicaragua, not only has the incidence of the disease diminished, 
hasn't gone away. It's diminished, but also productivity has been raised. So right. it's like a it's a win win situation for both the company and for the the labor force. And so for me, this is really a, a project related to human rights, to labor rights, to you know the, we get cheap sugar and cheap rice because folks like Walter. This, the gentleman oh. in this picture, who, by the way, died in January at the oh. age of 32, oh. so from this disease. So, wow. um, anyway, so so you know, for me, these are the kinds of passion projects that um, they mean so much to me, and I've been fortunate with this particular project. To the work has appeared in you know major publications around the world, websites, and uh, it was uh, exhibited in Perpignan, in France, a few three years ago. So, um, but most importantly is it's, it's part of an initiative to find the cause and come up with a solution to this awesome. issue. Well, thank you for doing that. Um, and I'm sure the, the people of Nicaragua are extremely thankful. Tell me about some of the specifics, like the technical side of this photograph. What did you capture it with? Do you remember? It's a fairly wide lens, right? I mean, it's... yeah. So I, or yeah, so I, I, my kit is generally like a 5D. That was probably with a Mark III. I work with a Mark IV now, but yeah. uh, Canon 5D. And then uh, my favorite lens is the 24 to 105. Yeah. But, but because of I do so much video and filmmaking now, I've I know this is kind of lame, but at my tender age, I've rediscovered prime lenses. <laughs> uh, that's interesting. You're going back to primes. <laughs> Exactly. You know, I came up probably like you, you know, working with Leicas and Canons, you know, and and prime lenses. You never even thought about using a zoom lens, you know. But then once the digital revolution hit somewhere around 2002, 2003, I shifted to digital. Yeah. And and, you know, the quality of the zoom lenses are excellent now. And also, I like to work light because I want to be fleet footed i want to be able to move and get in and out of situations i don't want to have a big footprint as yeah. it is i'm relatively tall you know I, I, it's going to be hard for me not to stand out but as much as possible i like to work in this very light touch and yeah. so having one camera and one lens is my preferred method of working when i'm shooting stills but um Anyway, so that was made with a Canon 5D and the 24 to 35, yeah. and probably oh 24 yeah, to like, 35, okay. Oh, sorry, 24 to 105. Yeah, 24 to 105. Sorry, and uh, that was it. The situation though was we had basically spent time with him. It was very early in the morning. We were done. We we were leaving, and then as he was walking us out of this is like his little compound, very very uh, humble place where he lives. They were you know as part of the morning ritual of cleaning their their place they would gather all the leaves and twigs and the piles and burn them and it just it was one of those moments where you know we're walking i'm we said goodbye i'm all ready thinking about where we're going next and then i turn around and i see this scene and it was like stop boom <laughs> you know, stop and i just said stop just basically that's it and then i i made a few frames probably not more than 10 or 20 frames something like that and then went on and uh, thankfully, you know, made a, a good picture there. You know, uh, I believe you know Bob Holmes, right? Aren't you guys? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Bob brought up this quote from Minor White about you. You kind of enter a, the best way to take a photograph, or make a photograph, is you have like a blank mind, and you let the photograph come to you, which is what you're kind of describing here. It just sh it just shouted out at you. And yeah. you just they said that to... about they said that about love too. <laughs> it just you a blank mind and let it come to you. Okay, well that is probably a way to do it. But it it sounds to me like that's you're you're being you're willing to receive the the image and not get in the way of it, right? I mean Bob Bob says, look, don't let your camera get in the way of your photography. You know, it's it's it, right. And a lot of people need to learn that lesson. The camera cannot be a distraction from seeing the image because otherwise you're going to miss it. Yeah. And that's a great point. You know, I don't talk a lot about at this point in the teaching and mentoring that I do, you know, it's generally at an advanced level. So we're, we're not talking, you know, I'm basically talking to peers. So yeah. we're rarely talking about kind of nuts and bolts of photography. But one of the things I've always 
uh, held dear was this idea that, um, you know, you, you basically want this photography is, is about very, all these variables that we work with. And, and I want to limit the variables so that, as you say, I can just focus on what is in front of me. And in a sense, you know, obviously I'm not the first person to say this. I wish it could just be embedded in my, in my eye or in my head, but <laughs> you know, short that of way. that, short of that, which would be kind of weird, um, yeah. you know, that, that it's really about finding, you know, finding a, a setup that allows you to work as effortlessly as possible. So as you sort of rightly said, in a sense, the camera disappears. I have got to underscore that because this is so important because unlike what you'll see on a lot of other YouTube channels that are kind of pushing you in the opposite direction, you know, again, we, we're, we're talking with working photographers here who do have to keep things simple, but eliminating the variables in, the, in that little phrase Ed, is such, such a, a, a massive amount of power in terms of putting your attention on what you really should be putting it on, which is making the photograph. So eliminating the yeah. variables is, yeah. we have to underscore that, put some stars next to it, because that's really that's important. Right. Okay, well, and also look, it's go ahead. also because you 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 don't want the equipment to get in the way of your of the human connection. Absolutely. You know and and uh, so yeah no it's uh, super super important. Okay cool. Well let's look at this uh, next one. You mentioned these are the um, prison inmates. What ha what's happening in your sh in black and white? Okay, was this film or was this digital? So this is uh, the film Leica days. This is uh, yeah. pre-digital. Uh, and this is part of my, um, you know, massive project on aging in America that I did with my wife, Julie Winoker. Uh, we began it in 1995 and worked through till 2003 on it. Uh, we went to 25 states uh, over that period of time wow. and uh, produced a film and a, a documentary film, uh, you know, a, a book called Aging in America and, you know, multiple exhibitions. And and it's 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 work that lives continues to live through today. And, and um, um, you know, it's like a living archive. Uh, but anyway, so back then when, you know, in the film days, I would generally shoot my personal projects in black and white. Yeah. Uh, and so that's, you know, this and I think the next picture are from the Aging in America project. This specific image, um, this uh, was actually the very first story that we did as part of the project, which was looking at aging prisoners. You know, at that point in 1995, 96, I think we shot, I photographed this um, you know, the the elderly prison population, that was the fastest growing segment of our prison population. Really? And, wow. Yeah. And so I, I went to Alabama and Texas. It's interesting. I wonder if I could get into those prisons today because things have tightened up so much in terms of access. Yeah. But uh, back then I was fortunate to get in and uh, work, you know, somewhat freely. And um, that 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 story ended up being published in the New York Times Magazine, so it was a wonderful way to begin what ended up being, uh, you know, a very long project, at least for me, a very long project of almost eight years. And the way I approached that project was in an episodic form, if you like, where you know we'd look at aging prisoners, then I, you know, we looked at burlesque dancers, uh, you know, uh, nursing homes, uh, the Senior Olympics, the Senior Pro Rodeo. You know, we we were coming yeah. with all these examples of how Americans were using the gift of longevity to either enjoy what is basically 30 more years to our lifespan. But in other cases, it's a, it's a prolonged period of misery or loneliness or, or, or anyway. So, so we were looking at like the whole gamut of life in that project. You know, what I see interesting about this, Ed, um, <clears throat> Deanne Fitzmaurice, I believe you know her too. Of right. course. Yeah. So she talked about, you know, frames within frames and how oftentimes you can take one image and you could you could split it into, you know, three or more photographs. And that's what I see here, because you have the guy on the right. He's in his own frame. You have the two guys in the background. They're kind of in their own frame. And then you have the guys on the left. And then you even have the window, the reflection 
you know, of whatever the trees behind it. But is is that something you strive for? I mean, in terms of, you know, what you're looking for in an image? Yeah, well, in general, I like layered imagery. You yeah. know, that's that's generally what I strive for. You know, the first two images were examples of uh, more, um, uh, uh, you know, simpler compositions, yeah. a single person in the frame, even though there was there were layers to those images as well. But in this case, this is a good example of a more complex layered image where it's not only layered foreground, middle ground, background, but it's layered, you know, horizontally, if you yeah. like, across the frame. And that is... You know, I realize sometimes I'll finish a, I'll, I'll, I'll finish with a scene or, a, 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 you know, a, and I'll realize, like, I never did a simple shot because all I was looking for was that complex shot. And then sometimes I'm thinking, oh, man, I might have missed the essence because I was so, uh, you know, consumed with trying to make a complex image. And what's interesting shooting a lot of working in a lot of video is it's 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 sort of. I've evolved in that sense because yeah. when you work in video and film, you've got to get details. Right. You've got to get tight shots. Yeah. You've got to get wide shots and sense of place images. You know, I always, t when I teach about photography and the, the language of narrative photography, I talk about kind of four basic images and, you know, my God, this is not like a, a, a biblical, uh, you know, from the Mount here. It's just, what I see from not only in my own work, but what I've seen at having been uh, obsessed with photography for more than 40 years now. And, and in narrative photography, you basically have environmental portraits, the sense of place or landscape, the detail, and the candid moment. And within those four kinds of images, and please understand folks, you do whatever you want and take those four ideas and break them and mess with them but would you but would you repeat with, that again just so we we yeah. really got it the four yes yeah, so so we'll start you know the landscape or sense of place okay that could be could be a room it could be a landscape like a, a you know a monumental scene like ansel adams yeah. it can have people it doesn't have to have people but it's that idea of it could be a street scene the sense of place sense established of place. you know what does it look like where you are right then there's the candid moment, which is what I love taking the most, which is yeah. that, you, you know, unadultered, no direction, no, no footprint of the photographer. Maybe our visual voice might be in it. But, you know, basically we have not directed, we have not moved anything. And it's just capturing the magic moments. Yeah. Then there's the environmental portrait. That's right. the only picture as a photojournalist where I where ethically you're allowed to direct you're allowed to, you know, move the subject. You're allowed to tell them, you know, smile or or, or frown or, right. or look to the right. That's Annie the only Leibovitz, as an example, or Richard yeah. Avedon, yeah. Yeah, and and you know, the environmental portrait can say so much, you know, if you really make a great one. And then the last image or type of image is the detail, and that for me, in many ways, is the toughest image mm. person. That's the toughest image for me to see because, um, you know, it could be anything. It could be something hanging on the wall. It could be an assemblage of items on a table in your subject's house, you know. And and what's what's interesting, as I've learned with the detail image, is the older I've gotten or the more experience I've gotten in life, not just in photography, I actually see more meaning in things. You know, like as I become more educated that, you know, that 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 religious symbol on the wall now, maybe 20, 30 years ago, I had no idea what it meant. Right. Now I understand what it means. And so then that means these inanimate objects become imbued with more meaning. And so the the, the challenge is how do you make a beautiful, powerful, interesting image of objects? But when you when you approach a narrative you know, this is about narrative photography, linear photography. I'm not talking about conceptual work. That's a totally different kind yeah. of. When you're trying to be a story, visual storyteller, to me, those are those four images are like the building blocks of a narrative. That's fantastic. And speaking of religion, we have uh, Sharon from Tel Aviv wishing us a happy Passover. And uh, back at you, everybody, happy Passover. 
And so let's look at the next one. This is also part of your Aging in America project. This was also undoubtedly film. I can see the grain in it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's, so, uh, I'd be cu sure. curious about just, to, you know, from again, from a technical standpoint, you were shooting with your Leica here? Yeah. That was with the Leica and the probably 35 1.4 lens. Oh, God, I love that lens. Wow. Uh, that is a and, um, 35 1.4. Wow. Yeah. And that was – this is one of the most moving um, scenes, experiences that I've really had in yeah. my life. Uh, I had – we were working in rural West Virginia um, looking at the issue of uh, rural hospice care. And we had found out through our research this wonderful local organization in West Virginia that was, you know, addressing the needs of, of rural folks who were, you know, you know, in need of hospice. And so we had gone the summer before. This image was made, I think, in October of 2000. We had gone that summer uh, actually with our family. Then our kids were maybe, uh, you know, five and eight years old. They're pretty young. Um and we spent time with this with this couple. This is a ninety year old couple. The woman is Maxine, and the man next to her, Arden. They had been married for seventy years. Wow. Anyway, and, and and we we befriended them and spent a week with them. And then I decided to return later that year, that October, for for what was supposed to be a family reunion. And uh, then I was living with with them in the farmhouse. And in the middle of that week she died and this is the moment where she's dying yeah and so um yeah anybody who's ever experienced a, a family member a, a parent dying this immediately pulls on your heart because you know this is exactly what it's like and the composition is astounding because you have sort of almost like these two lines the guys on the right and the and the couple on the on the left just those are almost like two leading lines in a way to the subject there and she, and she's got a lot of light on her i guess it's coming in from that window there so she's in she's pretty lit and it's you know even a little blown out in the background but well, she was actually it was like she was disappearing it was yeah. a, as a, it oh, was an amazing funny. moment yeah yeah it was interesting because I was living in San Francisco then, and I um, I worked with uh, Kirk Onspach, an amazing you know master black and white printer, old school. Um, and uh, the first time he printed that for me, he actually burned it in because he thought, oh, there's a that was a mistake. You know? Oh, I see. Yeah. And I was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> don't don't ruin the magic. But but uh, yeah, that's, so that's. An incredible again the gods were with you on that one ed yeah all right oh by the way bob holmes says hello and hello bob now we're coming to the the interest most interesting shot here i think of our our recent discussion this is the um prostitute in is this in vietnam no no that's in india india okay sorry yep you're right yeah and again, composition-wise, you have frames and frames and layers. And tell us about this image. I know we were discussing it beforehand about how it appeared in National Geographic, and it was about stemming the spread of HIV. Yeah, in India. So I don't know, for the folks who are listening, who have tuned in, if any of you saw my brief uh Instagram post yesterday of this image <laughs> and especially if any of you were upset by it I would love to have a conversation with you about it but um, anyway let me see where do we begin let's begin with the photograph so this was part of a, a big project that I had proposed to National Geographic uh, in 2006 or 7 I think it was looking at uh, the golden quadrilateral highway in India and it was the largest infrastructure project at that point in the in in the history of India, basically connecting the whole country. And so, I wasn't interested in you know construction of a road. I was using it as a metaphor 
for how India was modernizing. Right. Or in some cases, what are the issues that they were dealing with? Uh, you know, because so anyway, one of the issues, especially back then, thankfully, it, it's not an issue now, was uh, the spread of AIDS and HIV. And it was mostly being done by truck drivers. India, even in 2007, had something like over four million truck drivers alone. And so it was a huge problem. And the, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation um, did a wonderful job of working with Indian doctors and the Indian government to create a campaign, an awareness campaign among truck drivers. And so, you know, while I photographed, you know, uh, skits that Indian actors were performing at the truck stops to talk about the use of condoms and safe sex, uh, I also wanted a picture that would be jarring. Yeah. And so because I, I what I what I want is I want to capture people's attention so then they'll read the caption. Yeah. Which is the big mistake I made yesterday on the Instagram my Instagram feed. I'm so sorry. What anyway, is the caption that you were going to put in there? Well, which is the caption which is basically that so this is in a bathhouse uh just outside of Bangalore along this highway. And, and there's a certain kind of bathhouse in India. And if anyone is Indian or listening in, you can I welcome any corrections or any mistakes I might make here. But here goes. And so um, this particular bathhouse, it was mostly trans folks that were they were not women. Um, they were in some stage of transitioning from men to women. Okay. And they were prostitutes. They were sex workers. And right. so this is a place that you know, truck drivers would stop to, you know, have sex. And so I spent about a week in this bathhouse going back almost every day. You know, first, the first time I went, I went with an Indian doctor who explained who I was, what I was trying, why I was there and what I was trying to do. And they and the and the and the folks in this bathhouse understood it and they welcomed me. We hung out, you know, they, we played dominoes together. We, you know, we we did the, you know, we, we basically I did everything you're supposed to do to get access to a situation that is otherwise not something you can just walk in and start photographing in. And so it was maybe the fifth or sixth time I had been there that all of a sudden one of the one of the women uh, grabbed me and uh, and brought me to this room. And the scene you see is what I saw. Wow. So it was one of the workers, the madame, actually. Who, who was like, I know this is what he wants. And this is a very interesting thing. Uh, this goes to the element of um, often I think of subjects, and I know that's a term that we're trying to get away from, but they're really more like collaborators. Yeah. Because if you've explained yourself properly and honestly, and you've been humble and, and they understand, then there's a kind of collaboration that takes place. And so they understood what I was looking for. And when this young truck driver came in, they grabbed me and brought me to this room. And I made maybe 10 or 20 frames, something like that. Yeah. Uh, I think it was maybe 30 seconds. It was one of those moments in life where it, it felt like minutes, but was probably only seconds, you know? Yeah. And then she grabbed me and took me away. <laughs> and then, and so then I, so the point of this picture and it was published in the magazine in 2008 as part of the story was to draw attention to the efforts that were being made to stem the, t the spread of HIV and AIDS in India. And, you know, I want to just speak on your behalf here for a second that that, you know, the importance is that this image served a purpose and it was published in National Geographic and it's part of your portfolio. It has a tremendous amount of emotional impact. And uh, because you were had built that trust and that's another big key point that we should look at i mean you don't just walk in and 30 seconds with your camera with no trust having having been established and and capture this kind of image yet like you said you had to play dominoes and and build the build that rapport with with the people and then madame then brought you she brought you to that image another example of be receptive and the, let the image come to you, which it did literally. But well, Ed, I I, it's just the, yeah. the power of a photograph in this case, you know, with HIV is 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 obvious here. Yeah. And, and also what what's also 
so I don't for those of you who hopefully you care or don't whatever. But what happened yesterday was we my studio manager and I, we posted this. I, I and we we were just it was a lame move. We put the promotional text for this talk at the top right. and actually initially didn't even put the caption information. So mea culpa. OK, really, you're, really you're forgiven bad. by me for sure. Yeah, but it was like really, uh, you know, my bad big time on that, especially with an image like this. Yeah, that it's... does require way more sensitivity than so. But but what I wanted to say was because some and then I finally I took it off my feed because I'm a very sensitive person. And I yeah. mean, some of the vitriolic remarks, you know, like white male gays, guys, I'm not white. Right. Okay? My kids are from Baghdad. So. We cleared, alert. That, cleared that misconception right, right. Out. be careful what you what you uh, presume about things this is um, very true you know i got i i i followed like the perfect approach to having access to a sensitive subject yeah. but but one of the one of the comments that was repeated and this is a really important one is this idea of um you know how would she even though it's a man you know it's a trans it's trans person not a woman but yeah. how how would they feel if they knew their picture was being published even if they had given you permission in the moment and this cuts to a really really important issue that thankfully has come up in the last i want to say five ish years maybe more but particularly in the last few years and and it's really been brought up by like the new generation of of photographers and it's a it's a really important and beautiful thing even though it makes our job harder which is that just because you get someone to sign a model release or just yeah. because you get someone to say yeah you can photograph me that doesn't mean they understand the implications of the use of that image right. and so while it puts tremendous burden and responsibility on us right because we're working so hard to get access we get you to say yes or we get you even to sign a model release yet even still we need to be careful and so i totally get that um and i don't have a great answer to it other than what it has made me do now is i work way more carefully yeah and i i wonder it might be weird to say this, but I wonder if today I was approaching that subject, if I'd make a picture like this. I'm not sure. Interesting. Yeah, I'm not sure. I don't know uh, because things are so. It's definitely changed. I mean, Cartier Bresson, who who probably never got a model release ever. No, I know it's brought up a lot, and it, it's an interesting moral, yeah. philosophical, ethical point and i guess we each have to decide on our own what what uh how you do it and but in this case i just want to underscore the fact that yes you were given access and in addition to that it served a very powerful purpose yeah. ed are you okay on time can we keep talking about these sure sure awesome i am it's thoroughly enjoying it now we are in the uh Woman on uh, in in a stand. So tell us about this one. Okay, so this is um, this is from uh, my first project with National Geographic, uh, a story that I proposed to them back in 1990, 91, uh, looking at the Kurds. Uh, it was the struggle of the Kurds, and this was a subject that I became very passionate about, and um, was actually prepared. I already bought my tickets to to Turkey to go out on my own. And uh, a friend urged me to write a, a letter, a proposal to National Geographic. And I'm so happy I listened to him. And I'm very fortunate that they accepted the proposal. And that set me off on a 26 week, eight country, massive project. Um, certainly the biggest project I ever did for National Geographic, uh, looking at the Kurdish people and the plight of the Kurds. And it ended, ultimately that work was anthologized in a book called uh, When the Borders Bleed, The Struggle of the Kurds, um, which was published in 94. So this image was, uh, this is a really interesting 
uh, the background to this was a few days before this image was made. I, I'll never forget this. I was in some phone booth in Van, Turkey, V-A-N, Van, Turkey, which is way out in a sort of eastern, northeastern part of, of, of Turkey. And I was on the phone with my photo editor and she was basically reaming me out. So remember, I'm like, whatever, 32 years old. This is my first assignment for NASA Geographic. You know, a massive assignment for one of the hardest things, certainly the hardest thing I'd ever done at that point in my life. And she's basically, I can't even remember, but all I know is like, I was standing in that phone booth watching my life end, uh-huh. you know, and, and thinking that she was basically going to pull the plug on the story. And so out of that conversation came the decision to redirect this is the value of working with great editors to redirect yeah. my energy and instead we i can't remember who came up with it but it was like okay i'll go back to diarbakir the main city and i'm going to follow a human rights lawyer and it was that apocryphal decision so then three days later i'm with this human rights lawyer and you know i'm struggling you know how, how do you make interesting pictures of a you know, it's a man behind a desk with a bunch of papers or he's in a in a crappy room talking to people, you know, and, you you know, how, how am I, how am I going to make something interesting? But ultimately, this woman who uh, who was charged with uh, this is a terrorist courtroom in Diyarbakir, Turkey, she, um, she, she was his client. So anyway, to make a long story short, because of that, I got into this courtroom and then this image was made. And when it was published, the Turkish government in 1992, when the story came out, it was a cover story, they confiscated all the issues of that magazine and they changed the rules of access to those courts. Wow. So, you know, just to to some like background in that Turkey, there's been a terrible uh, uh, conflict, uh, the separatist movement by the Kurdish people from Turkey the PKK, Kurdistan Workers Party, uh, and the Turkish government and the military. You know, tens of thousands of people have died. It's a terrible thing because, you know, it's just so sad. It's so sad. Uh, but anyway, and, and so that for background, that image was a very controversial image then. Now they don't have those courts. They would never allow a photographer in them anyway. Right. And again, we have frames within frames, and and uh, you know, obviously, amazing composition. What more can we say? That's a that's a beautiful image. Uh, I well, also, also I'll never forget because I think I only, I, I had like a flash fill on it. I yeah, maybe, I was going to ask you if there I, was a fill. Yeah, I maybe shot like literally six under ten frames, and then the judge pointed at me and was like, "Sit down." And <laughs> there I you are. Down, but then I realized like, whoa, I OK. So as as I sat down without them seeing me, I like took the roll of film out of the camera. I stuck it in my sock and I reloaded my camera because I thought, oh, my gosh, are they going to potentially gonna pull it? Right? Confiscate. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, what did what? OK, so this was film. What camera were you using? Do you remember? Oh, that was, I've always shot with Canon. That was not with a Leica. I, yeah. It was probably, gosh knows, what, what was I shooting with then? Uh, what were the Canons back then? An I F, can't even remember. Or F1 or, yeah. uh, or uh, like an EOS AE2 or one of those wonderful Canon camera bodies. And then that was probably a 35, probably a 35 or 28 fixed lens. And the lens. film was... Uh... So back when I was in shooting color slide film, it was either... Uh, a Fuji film like at 100 ASA, like uh, Fuji Chrome or, uh, yeah. you know, sometimes Velvia or Kodachrome 200, yeah. which I would push. Isn't that interesting, folks? Think about this. Back then, you pushed your film to 360 ISO. Whoa. And it was like, whoa. Yeah, that's really now pushing. I have a Canon camera that I can put to like 36,000 ISO. <laughs> it's and it's, it's crazy. still using the image. It's amazing. Okay, it is this is so much easier now. It is. I mean, it, it it's truly is. I love this image. The the boy jumping over the the uh, junk that's burning. 
I, this this has so many things going for it, Ed. I, tell us what the story is, and then I'm going to ask you some questions about it. Because there's the guys yeah. in the background that you initially don't even see because of the smoke, but they're there. And the peak of the of the cathedral. I mean, okay, what's going on here? Is this in Ireland? Yeah, this is in uh, this is in Northern Ireland yeah. in, uh, in, uh, in Derry or London Derry if you're Protestant. <laughs> um, by the way, are we going to take any questions? Or... Yeah, we, I okay, thought we'd go right. through this one or we'll take some questions. Cool, cool. So yeah, this is my this was from my first personal project of any significance. I spent three years uh, between 1988 and 1991 going back and forth between San Francisco and Northern Ireland to create a what was my first body of work and really it was that project that facilitated me breaking in to National Geographic and then moving on to the Kurds but um so in this scene um so I focused on the Protestant community in Northern Ireland that was the focus of my project because back then and even today I'm always looking for either underreported stories or finding a unique angle into a story that we think we all know yeah. so in this especially as an American back then, you know, you heard about the IRA, you heard about the British military, you heard about the Catholic, the beleaguered Catholic minority, but you never really heard stories about the Protestant community. And the more research I did and the more I came to learn about that community, I, I became enthralled with it. And I became enthralled with Ireland and, uh, you know, the Northern Irish. And so I set about doing almost like an anthropological look at this group of people of roughly whatever, a million, million and a half people, whatever the population, that were holding on fiercely to their Britishness. And um, anyway, so this image was uh, every every summer they have uh, what's called the marching season, uh, sort of June, July, August, in throughout the province of Northern Ireland. And um, they, cre they build these bonfires that they then set alight. Uh -huh. And so this was, I think, the m evening after you know when the bonfires were being lit it's amazing and these young and these young kids were jumping over it so you know i was fortunate enough to be in the in this place and get that moment it's brilliant all right let's take some questions so uh, this comes from jared uh ed can you speak to the tension between the sense of objectivity expected as a photojournalist in contrast to the passion of you being vis-a-vis -vis your inner activist or is ob objectivity impossible yeah so you know it's a good question and it's one that comes up a lot I, i'm a look if i'm on assignment if i'm working for a client whether it's the new york times or national geographic time magazine a foundation an ngo I will be uh, objective in terms of how I approach the subject matter. And another thing that's really important is um, when you're, especially when you're dealing with situations where there's a security issue or it's a hyper political or, or religious as well. In other words, where passions can be stirred, you really need to, I'm not a poker player because I'm way too transparent emotionally, but yeah. you really need to hold your opinions to yourself and you need to hold your emotions uh, unless it's like a human moment where someone has died or something you know universal or there's a marriage and you can certainly smile and be happy but but anyway so you really need to hold that stuff in because you can actually destroy your access or ruin you know or also you know ethically like if you're working for publications you you need to remain a you need to have a objective posture Otherwise, you're just not being professional. Right. Now, when I'm working on my own projects or when I'm working on, like, advocacy work, that's where I'm allowed, even though I'll still keep it in check because I don't want to offend anyone, you know, or ruin my access uh, or endanger myself, um, you know, then I can be a little more subjective, if you like, you know. But, but one another way I'd like to answer that question is that, you know, damn it, there are issues in the world, and I'm sorry, there aren't two sides to it. Yeah. There's a problem, and it needs to be fixed. Yeah. Good one. Okay. Um, Italy, it, 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 I'm sorry. Does photo, is photojournalism dying? Um, 
No, it's not yeah. dying. It's just morphing. Yeah. You know, I love the Frank Zappa quote for those of you who might have heard of him or remember him, uh, <laughs> you know, where he was asked, you know, is jazz dead? And he said, jazz is not dead. It just smells funny. But um, anyway, but I, <laughs> I haven't heard that. But, um, no, Good old Frank think, Zappa. Yeah. No, I think that um, what is happening is the market for photojournalism has been severely eroded and it's sort of morphed it's it's it, and it is morphing in front of our eyes yeah so you know i always like to put it this way i i have never been able to reach more people in more places around the globe with my work yes but i've also never been paid so little for that it's a sad thing ed well it's a conundrum so you yeah. know you need to be creative look this was never an easy profession so you need to be creative, whether it's, you know, you do a certain kind of photography to make a living and then you work on your journalistic or documentary work, you know, with the goal of eventually finding, you know, being paid for it or finding homes for it where you're compensated. Yeah. But, um, yeah, you know, and that's and also photojournalism is not monolithic, right? You can you can work for Getty Images or, or a newspaper and be a photojournalist where you're you're going out covering, you know, breaking news or conflict or, you know, daily life in that sense. Or, you know, the way I work, which is long form, in depth, I can I take, you know, months or years to develop my projects. Um, and then, yeah, so, you know, and I would also say, finally, I'm so sorry to be long winded, is that no you need to look as a photojournalist today. If you don't work in film or audio, you're at a real disadvantage. And that once, if you if you develop those further skills, then you can also work for a, a larger array of clients, like you know NGOs and foundations and nonprofits. You know, a little known fact: uh, I talked to somebody from Canon. The 5D. Mark II was originally developed for that purpose because they knew that photojournalists needed to be able to shoot video. And at that point, it was unheard of, right? That was the only camera you could do that with. Now, every every camera you can shoot videos and stills. But, but that was how they entered that market. And it was brilliant because exactly what you say. Ed, I have totally enjoyed this. We have a lot of information here to digest. So you guys need to watch this again. It's going to come out tomorrow at 11. Watch it again. Is there any final advice you'd like to leave our viewers with in terms of upping their game as photographers? Yeah, well, it's a tricky moment, right? Uh, because of the pandemic. So, yeah. uh, um, and also my heart goes out to folks in Italy and Spain, my God, and Iran and the places that have been hit so hard and, and, and hopefully the rest of the world will, and China, of course, and New York city. World. Well, my gosh, yeah, I'm 12 miles from the epicenter. And, yeah. uh, just, just, uh, three days ago, uh, a, a, a dad in his sixties died across the street from us. So it's come that close to us. Wow. Um, within yards of us. Uh, so, um, you know, I would say, uh, I want to answer that question in two ways. In the current moment, please be safe and be careful. Don't take any undue risks. You can still photograph. Photograph in your home. My gosh, this is a great moment to develop those, not only the skills of photographing in your own home, but um, you know, often we say that the hardest things to photograph are what we're closest to. Right. And so here's a challenge for you. Try to photograph your friends, your family, wh whoever you're around. But it's also go out and when you go on those walks or you go on a bike ride or whatever, as long as you're doing it safely and you're keeping your social distance, there's so much to photograph. <clears throat> so, you know, that's something I would advise. Now, when this is finally over, because we will prevail, yeah. this will be over, um, you know, my advice to you is find what stirs your passions. That's always going to be the greatest source of your work. What do you care about? And then commit yourself to documenting it. Brilliant. Ed, thanks again. You know, I, right. I really appreciate having you back on the show. We probably will want to do it again because I know you got a lot more to talk about and I certainly have All more right. questions. So be well. I'll ping you later after the show.
All right. Take care, man. Be okay. well. Thanks a lot. Be well, everyone. Bye All bye. right. So you guys, that was brilliant. I'm sure we all learned a lot from that. I certainly did. And we're going to, uh, as I said, we're going to publish it. We are putting these on. Uh, we have a page on my website where we put these interviews up with uh, as podcasts. And by the way, we're going to start doing audio versions of these really soon, hopefully next week. So you can listen to them. You can watch them. But go there because we'll have show notes. We'll have his images up there and notes from the interview. And you can also leave your questions and comments. And it's a good way for us to keep interacting. Um, follow us, OK, because you can then keep up to date with what's going on. Follow me on Instagram. Follow Ed. Definitely follow Ed. OK, and tell your friends. This is a um, this is a pretty unique experience. Where else on the internet are you going to get this kind of content? I mean, really, come on, you guys. So, will you please, every one of you, turn into an evangelist for advancing your photography live? We really need to spread the world the word to the world, <laughs> get more people watching, tuning in, being a part of this. This is this is like you are learning from the most amazing photographers in the world, okay? Uh, subscribe if you haven't already done that, enable the bell, share this video, share it when it comes out, like it, leave your comments in the actual video. So tomorrow this will come out at 11. Tomorrow at 10 o'clock, we have our friend Bob Holmes back with us again for some more I don't know. We haven't decided what we're going to talk about yet, but we'll decide. And it's going to be an amazing episode as always. So I think that's about it. I love you guys. Thank you for joining us. Happy Passover. Stay well, be well. And remember to get out and capture your own images of life. See you again soon, you guys. And take care.